What you doing? Ran out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. By singing dog. By goal. I pronounce you. By wedding ceremony. Stop. At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T-Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions. Blog Talk Radio. Hey, everybody. It's 530, and I was supposed to be on the air a minute ago, so I apologize for that. I was rushing around at the last minute, and I have a cat that's going crazy in my kitchen, and I'm nervous, and I'm getting wine together, and so we're finally here together. Very excited. Murder and McHenry is one of the many things we're going to be talking about today. Many of you might know Paul um, from that book alone, but uh, if I do my job properly and correctly, you're going to find out that Paul is a man of many means and not just his book alone. So without further ado, let me get him on the line, and we can start chit-chatting with him and see what goes from there. Paul? Hi, Cindy. Hello? Hi. <laughs> How are I'm you? It's late, but I'm here. I'm nervous. I'm here, How too. are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. <laughs> You're just so calm. So here I am. Everything's great. Yes, I'm nervous. You're a big deal. Oh, I don't know if I'm a big deal. I don't think so. I think so. And many others think so. I'm just going to well, tell you I that. I appreciate that. I'm showing I can tell you that. You're quite All right. Nervous. I like that. Um, well, good. You'll be getting a lot of compliments, so just get used to it. Can I get comfortable where you are and such? Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is murder in McHenry. Um, not because it's okay. not important, but I think that it's more important that we establish who Paul is before we get to the culmination of where Paul has eventually ended up. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay, good. I have a first question for you. Okay. Okay, here we go. Although your audiences most oftentimes acknowledge you as an author, now I know that you had held the very high honor of moonlighting as a Marine up until the year 1995. So to begin with, maybe you could talk to us a little bit and explain your experiences as well as your stance on the current ISIS situation, because a lot of us have been talking about that. So maybe just tell us a little bit, chronicle some of your favorite flashbacks in terms of when you were serving, and then kind of talk about present day. Please. Wow. Yeah, that that is definitely a different twist. Nobody's ever asked me something like that before. Um, but, you know, <laughs> just, we, de- we definitely are having a problem with ISIS, uh, no doubt about it. And, and I, I think what we've learned through uh, the previous wars that we've been in for the last decade plus um, is that uh, we can make a bigger mess if we're not careful. Um, so I think we need to be careful here, too. Um, I think what we need to do is to have uh, the folks in the Middle East, I think they need to step up and clean up their own neighborhood while we provide support and intelligence and uh, from the air, um, but not, not our groups, on, uh, our troops on the ground, but their troops. Okay. Now talk to me about you. You is in your experience as a Marine. Take us back to a younger Paul and talk to me a little bit about what you were like and what those experiences were like. Well, um, I, I, I joined the Marine Corps in 1991, uh, which was the lead up from Desert Shield to Desert Storm. Uh, people ask me, uh, you know, how did I wind up joining the Marines? I tell them I watched too much damn CNN uh, because that's all that was going on back in 1990 and early 1991 uh, was about the war in Iraq. And um, and I was just out of high school. I wasn't doing anything productive. And I felt like, man, I, I'm, I might as well be out there than screwing around and living it up over here. Um, so I joined the Marine Corps and... Um, I attacked it from the perspective of I wasn't going to make it a woulda, shoulda, coulda, like high school, I should have done this, I could have done that, and all that kind of stuff. And I went all out, and I, I really I had a, a great career in the Marine Corps. Um, I, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a very good thing for me, and, and it was very important that um, I did go through something like the Marine Corps and kind of shore up some of the things that um, weren't so solid as far as not having a father around, and we'll, we'll get around to that. But it helped me grow up quite a bit. So I'm very proud of uh, 
uh, my service as a Marine, and I'm very happy with what it's done for me for my life. Do you ever miss it? Do I have a what? Miss it. I'm sorry. Do you ever miss it? Miss oh, that do lifestyle? I miss it? Just miss some of the things that come with it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you you'll miss the camaraderie of you know being with Marines. We're we're definitely a breed of our own. Um, but you know it, it, it's a tough gig to live up to too. Um, I'm not sure. I'm 44 now, and I was in the Marines when I was 21. Um, I don't think I could do what I could do back then. Uh, so I don't miss all that stuff. But, yeah, I, I, I do miss the Marine Corps at times. Boys and girls, if you look at his personal Facebook page, as I did, because I creeped on it today when I was doing more research on you, you'll notice this very handsome picture of you when you were oh so young, because I'm guessing that that was you, right, the pictures that have been posted on your page. You look so handsome and so young. It was so cute. Oh, thank you. Saying, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I know. Yeah, I don't want to embarrass you, but you can't see me and I can't see you, so it's okay if you're all red. Because I'm like, yeah, I should mention that. You, you, a man in uniform is just awesome. That that That's right. And the Marines have the best uniform around. <laughs> Listen to him. Just so you all know. Absolute best hands down. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. I wanted to, you know, I, I think it's very important that in order to get to know someone, you have to start kind of backwards and then work your way forward, if that makes sense to you. Because you're a person. You've had a life. You weren't just writing for 20-some years. You were, you know, all these sorts of different things prior to this point. Make sense? That's correct. Thank you. Okay, good. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, for those that don't know, your hometown history, of course, this is your turf of today. So first question for you that I wanted to ask is, are you as recognizable or as revered in this particular town too? Because obviously most know you in McHenry, but is that the case where you are now? Um, no, it, you know, it, it's not the same thing. I currently live in Fort Worth. Um, I didn't grow up here. You know, nobody knows me from Adam. Uh, whereas, of course, McHenry County, I, you know, I grew up there. I went through all the schools. My brothers went through all the schools. Uh, my parents, you know, owned businesses there. So we were uh, more a part of the fabric of the community there than me just popping up in Fort Worth mm-hmm. like I did. Understand. And how long have you been in Fort Worth now? Um, seven years. Nice. And you like it? I, I do. I really do like it. Um, my, But I do say, you know, my house is in Texas, but my home's in McHenry. And not everybody reveres me so much in McHenry County. I would say most do, but not everybody. <laughs> we'll get into that one, my goodness. Sure. Okay, I want to speak to... Yes, I, we're going to go towards the what I call the bureaucratic business in your antecedent area, meaning that you publicly have powered against uh, candidate Zinke, I believe, to solidify the spot as sheriff because um, I believe their their elections coming up in March. Um, and if you could maybe share your side on this issue, along with the rationale revolving around you offering costless copies of Murder and McHenry. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, mm-hmm. the, the the election already happened. Um, the the big right. election, yeah, the big election was this past March, and um, and that was the Republican primary, and uh, there was the under sheriff Andrew Zanke, as you mentioned, who was running for sheriff of McHenry County. Well, I have a personal relationship with under sheriff Andrew Zanke, and I didn't agree that he would be the best thing for McHenry County. Um, so what mm-hmm. I did was to share my thoughts on under Sheriff Andrew Zanke and why I felt like he shouldn't be the man in charge or the highest badge in the county. Um, and in doing so, I also ran a campaign of giving away my book on Kindle uh, to the folks in the county right around the, the Republican primary. And I wound up giving away almost 3,000 copies of my book. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the price was right, that's for sure. But even with that, I, I was still really surprised. Um, I didn't spend any money on marketing or campaigning. I did everything myself. Um, so, and McHenry County is not that big of a county. It's, you know, 350,000 people. So uh, when you look at it from that perspective, 3,000 is really a quite a good penetration uh, for a guy just getting on social media. Correct. I agree 100%. That's part of the reason I wanted to bring it up. It kind of speaks to the substance of you. And again, back to your character, actually. Before I ask the next question, this is just a dumb question because I was actually in Chicago last weekend, and I'm just curious where McHenry is in relation to, uh, you know, because I know Illinois, but loosely. So let's say downtown Chicago. Where exactly is McHenry in relation to all that? Um, well, there's there's the town of McHenry that resides in McHenry County. And, and then that's where I'm from. I'm from the town of McHenry. And McHenry is okay. about 44 miles northwest of Chicago and probably about 40, 44 miles uh, southwest of Milwaukee. Um, so it's right along the Illinois-Wisconsin border. I would say it's probably about 10, 15 minutes away from the Wisconsin border. Oh, nice. That's cool. So you're up, that's relatively close to Gurney then. What? What's that? That's relatively close to Gurney then, yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like we're border, uh, you know, Gurney, probably Illinois, about, so. yeah, we're probably about um, 20 minutes, 30 minutes west of uh, Gurney. Almost direct west. Okay. Got it. Okay. I'm just trying to get my wheels and my bearings on because I'm like, okay, when I want to talk about the city or where it's located, I'd like to know where it is. And like I said, I was just in Chicago not long ago, and I'm like, that's got to be either past it or somewhere in the city. So I figured you'd know because obviously you're pretty familiar with McHenry. So thank you for that. Yeah, uh, yeah for absolutely. One. I appreciate it. So you got Lake County yeah. that, that borders <laughs> the lake, and then right next to Lake County okay. you have McHenry County. And both those counties okay. um, border Wisconsin. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I'm just not very astute when it comes to that. That's what they make GPS for. I mean, I am a chick and I'm a yeah, smart chick, right. but I'm like, really, I just would like to know. You know, it, it happens. Okay. I want to backtrack for just a second because there's something I forgot to do um, before we get into the next question, which is this. Um, anytime someone who comes on my show who happens to be former military, I bestow what I call a rather small, and unfortunately I wish it was bigger, but a gift to you. Um, I'm a writer, oh. just as you are, and I've been writing for 20 years. And one of the best pieces in my own personal opinion that I ever wrote, I, I did this for Veterans Day, I think it was, or whatever, and it's a uniform um, piece that I wrote, and it's, I want to try to get it to a million military people by the end of my lifetime. And a million people have either heard it, got a copy of it, etc. So from me to you, just be quiet for like two minutes, and I want to read this to you if that's okay, because it's my little gift to you, sure. one of them. Is that okay? Okay. That, oh, that Splendid Valor is the name of it. And it's only like ten lines or something like that. So this is how it goes, and this is written by me, and this is kind of an homage to all of you. It says, uh, blessed to possess a noble character, fearless and tenacious in spirit, a polished propensity for continual altruism, consummate projection of iconic heroism, possessing robust determination to the pursuit of peace. Your career personifies a testimonial of love, bestowing sufficient recognition of your accolades proves to be an eternal task. Furnishing our immunity from oppression warrants our consistent praise. Forever shall we persist in our quest to pay adequate homage. Humbled am I to be coexisting within our within your gallant realm. That's how it goes. That's wow. How it to you. I think it's okay. I, well, I thank know. you for that. It, it's been awful. I, I, <laughs> You're well, welcome. Thank you for that. Okay. That's, really? um, that's it's fancy okay? speak for, uh, yeah, that's fancy speak for having a good moral compass, I think. Yes. Yes. And, that, and, and that, that is a trait of military folks, an unselfishness and a strong moral compass. A moral compass is at the uh, basis of all our decision-making. So I, I think you, you hit on the high mm-hmm. points right there. Thank you very much. Well, like I said, it's the, it's the least that I could do. I sat around and thought about how could I recognize or realize, you know, how can I make other people realize that um, in, in something small? So that's kind of my contribution to all of you in a nutshell. So I keep trying to get it out there every chance I get. So thank you for letting me do that. Um, it's a little bit around but I thought you could stand to hear it. Yay. Okay. Back to you now. Off of me, onto you. 
Okay, so before we dig into um, what I would call telling the tragedy, of course, I want to talk a little bit about the true Ronald um, Scharf. Maybe enlighten your uh-huh. listeners to the lighter side of both love and life in your household with him. Oh, well, Ronald Scharf, he, he was my father. Um, he was uh, born in, in Chicago, and that, that's where he grew up. Um, he didn't finish high school. Um, and, uh, he always had a passion for business, um, and, uh, he met my mom, and they got married, uh, I think in the late 60s there, and, um, and he, with his passion for business, had an opportunity to open up a bar, um, with his cousin, um, Butch, my uncle, and, um, they opened up their first bar, um, called Cousin's Corner, in Brookfield, Illinois, um, which was off of Ogden Avenue, which is a big road in Chicago, um, and also in Las Vegas, and um, I think Maple, but I think on the corner of Ogden and Maple. Um, And then uh, uh, my dad had much success with that, and then he headed out to uh, McHenry County, and that's where, um, you know, I I grew up, spent most of my life, I I grew up uh, there when I was six, seven years old. And that's where we got our second bar, the PM Pub. Um, I'm the P, I'm Paul, and then my brother Mike uh, is the M. And fortunately, as far as naming the bar, Steve wasn't born yet. So it's the PM Pub, mm-hmm. so that, that worked out good. Nice. That's really cool, actually. How many parents do something like that? That's really neat. Yeah, it is kind of cool. Very much so. And a lot of times, or oftentimes, I should say, when stories get told and things like this, I think a lot of times people don't realize that Ronald um, isn't just um, a figurehead for a tragedy. He was a person. He had a life. He had a family. He had, I'm sure, an instrumental, acted as an instrumental inspiration for you, I'm going to gather. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we, we, we have a German last name, but my father is mostly Italian. Um, and, you know, he's very proud of being Italian. And, um, you know, we were, uh, you know, old school, you know, please, thank you, yes, sir, no, sir, that type of stuff. Um, and, um, you know, and that that's the thing that kind of stuck out about my father the most is, um, you know, to do the right thing is um, I, w- I would say, you know, if I was going to sum them up, that, that's the message that he would come across, do the right thing. Nice. And you're upholding to that message rather nicely, I might add. This is my personal opinion, but what, what's I'm that? a Paul backer, so I'm going to say that. I said you're upholding okay. his message. You're upholding in such a significant manner. Um, you're keeping to – he would be very proud. I'm 150% certain of that. Not that you need to hear that, but I'm certain of it. Um, you're just an upstanding, an upstanding gentleman, and I keep hearing this over and over again by people that know you, people that have interacted with you, um, people that have read your book. Um, you are highly respected, I guess for lack of a better term. I know an author should be able to come up with something better, but that's the first thing I can think of. You need to hear that, and you should know that in case you don't already. People look up to you tremendously and often, wow. just so you know. Well, I mean, thank you. Uh, I, I mean, that is really good to hear. You're welcome. Um, yeah, and, you know, and, you know, a lot of what it is that, you know, that I have done really is in, you know, the shadow of my father, you know, um, you know, my mission was to fix some things, but also to honor my father. So I had to do it in a way that I felt that, um, would be best to his memory and, um, you know, so do the right thing. And I guess it's working. I, I appreciate those comments. Of course, and and like I said, that comes from an abundance of people, not just me. Of course, I'm one little person who's got my own opinion. But oftentimes you go to the people that are closer to you or people that have worked with you, dealt with you, things like that, to get that information. So it's always, I think it's just, it's always helpful to have that person hear those things and know those things. So there you go. Um, Yeah, I'm blown away. So let's talk a little bit about, I'm sorry, well, it'll get worse. Don't feel bad. (laughs) There's more. (laughs) I can handle it. You came on the show that. I warned you that we are we're going in directions you haven't gone before. So see, I'm, I'm hopefully doing you, my job you, okay you here. You've delivered. You've delivered. Thank you. Well, we're not done yet. <laughs> Just I wait. Know. There's more. Um, 
So Paul, of course, uh, had traveled to the town of Las Vegas, of course, to trade tales and truths at the MopCon convention. Um, obviously, you and I share a bunch of different mutual friends who, of course, participated in the same venue and such. Um, to me, it almost sounded like a, more of a family reunion because some of the people that I spoke to, of course, you all know each other or you're all intertwined in some way or the other. So I had some questions in relative to that because some people or some fans even don't get a chance to go to these conventions, myself included. I had a sick child, so I, I didn't get to make it. So if you don't mind, I want to ask a couple of different questions relative to the convention itself, if that's all right. Sure. Um, sure. First of all, um, obviously, if I were to ask you, and this is a personal question because I've asked other people this, if I said to you, name one author that was present there, which to you is most representative of classic Costa Nostra. Because in a lot of times when people talk about the mob and the mafia and such, you know, there's a difference between watching The Godfather and living it. And I think people have mm. a difficult time distinguishing. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So maybe shed right, some light on right. that because you were in a room full of people, you know, who've lived it, husbands who lived it, lived the lifestyle. So, so talk to me a little bit about that number one choice, who you would have picked and said, yeah, that's about as point on as you're going to get. Okay. Well, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, Dennis Griffin, and and I, I've got a bias, and that's gonna come out here in a little bit, but um, but I'm sure. gonna I'm gonna say my friend Denny, and um okay. and, and the reason for it is you know Denny you know, uh, approaches subjects, and he's written a few books uh, about a couple mobsters, mm-hmm. about the mob and the cops, and then uh, the mob in Las Vegas. So he, he's got a few uh, mob true crime books. And um, and when he talks right. about his subjects or he works with his subjects, um, he goes from the perspective of like, look, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna place judgment on you. I'm not gonna glorify you, but I just want to go ahead and get to the facts. And it's really important that we do that for us to be successful in this project. And I plan on doing this to, and being successful at this project. So I need that commitment from you. So he you know he gets that commitment from his subjects that are in the book. And um and he and he goes through and he's just a straight shooter from it. You don't read his books and, and feel like this guy is really, you know, glorifying the mobsters. Or you don't get the other side of it that he's being really judgmental about these mobsters either. He's telling the stories. And these stories are important because they really are part of all our history. And if you are not familiar with the mob and how it works, I promise you, the mob has made us to who we are today. They are a big part of who we are today, the good and the bad of it. So I'm going with Denny. Okay, good answer, actually. I was just going to say that. Now, were you yourself anticipating when you got there uh, just a sense of personal excitement? Was there someone that you were just really geared up to meet yourself personally? Um, at MobCon, I'm always there. I'm I'm mm-hmm. always happy to meet new people. Um, so anybody new is exciting to me, you know. And um, if it, you know, if I wasn't an author or had a story to tell, I would be in the stands, you know, with everybody else. Um, these are very interesting people. They have very interesting stories to tell. Um, and I I think you know, being from Chicago probably like folks from Chicago, New York, Las Vegas, um, we we have uh, a fascination with the mob um, because they really, we, we tend to see it more clearly, uh, how the mob is part of our community or has been part of our community. Certainly. Makes perfect sense to me. It's one of those things I want to get to. I'm hoping. Um, is uh, is there any plans in the works, do you know, of a MobCon 2015? I haven't heard anything yet, and I thought you might be one to ask and, and see. Is, any thoughts on that, or has anybody said anything yet? Well, I, I, I haven't heard anything yet, so I, I really don't know. Um, I, I, I heard okay. potential rumors of maybe um, uh, it being on the East Coast this side, uh, this time, because uh, oh. the last two mob cons were in Las Vegas. Um, which, uh, you know, a lot of the guys from New York, that that's a pretty large travel commitment, um, and I, I think they want to get some more of the New York folks in there. But honestly, I don't know, Cindy. Right. Okay. Well, I guess we'll have to work on that one. I just thought, well, you're on here. What the hell? Why don't we just ask you? Because you have that's experience right. in this right. sort of thing. I don't. So. That's right. They, they both have been very successful, so 
I, I, I think okay. that will happen, but I don't know that. Yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Keep posted on Facebook. We'll just all keep our eyes open and see if something kind of pops up. Um, next question, somewhat relative to that. Um, you know, there are some of my friends, or our mutual friends, I should say, that are considered friend of the quote-unquote family, so to speak. Um, do you think that association such as that can be served as a compliment or as a curse sometimes? Because I have friends of mine, and then they know I know certain people, and they're like, not impressed. You know what I'm saying? And then other times mm-hmm. people are just, just in the glamour of all of it, like, oh, my God, it's so cool to know that. Do you know where I'm going with that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Speak a little bit about that. Cause... Sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and especially – being from my perspective, of, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to this, um, yeah, it, mm-hmm. it, it kind of makes it even more of a unique conversation uh, for me, you know, because folks are like, you know, how how can you be close to these people? And um, and it and it is a mixed bag, you know. I, I I've got people that you know, like you said, you know, oh my god, that's so cool that you know, you know, this guy, that guy, and you know, and everybody else. And then there's others, um, you know, I had one friend ask me, you know, that I was head to mob time, what do I tell his little girl of why I'm doing mob time? And, you know, and that was a really good question, you know. You know, how, how could I be involved in a tragedy that I am, but yet almost embrace uh, what became of my tragedy? And, um, and, and right. the uh, truth of it is, the people that that I know, they're you know they're no longer active as uh, m- mobsters or mafia or La Cosa Nostra, whatever you want to call them. Uh, many of them mm-hmm. have turned government witness. Um, so you know I don't place judgment on uh, the things that they've done you know in the past and whatnot. I'm more into who they are as a person now. And, you know, a lot of these folks, I mean, they're they're my biggest supporters. Um, but, you know, if I run into somebody that says, you know what, I, I could never be friends with a person like that, I don't try to talk them to the other side. I, I, I respect their judgment, I, I, and I respect the understanding of why they came to that conclusion. You know, myself, I feel like you can redeem yourself. Others feel like these folks can't redeem themselves. Well, I, I respect the character in both those statements, so I'm okay with it. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought that'd be an interesting one because I'm like, you you have a unusual paradox there where you're standing. So it's kind of like, yeah, I want to see which side of the fence he stands on, but that makes perfect sense to me. So thank you. Um, right. Next question. One of the things that predominantly crossed my mind earlier, as a matter of fact, today, I was thinking, okay, do you have, you yourself, any scares of personal safety surrounding yourself or your family, let's say, due to your constant diligence to deliver justice? Has that ever occurred to you that that you might be in some relative danger, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, Leading up to the March primary Mm -hmm. election. Um, yeah, I, I, I was definitely fearful. Not that, not that anybody actually threatened me. I never received any, any emails or a squirrel mailed to my door or anything like that. Um, but I very much knew, uh, the people that I was attacking or exposing. And, um, and I felt them to be very dangerous people. Very dangerous. So yeah, there was only, there was a concern only because it was smart to be concerned. Not that I ran into anything, but, yeah, I I was minding my P's and Q's as far as safety for a while. Sure. Do you feel that any of that might derail your eventual destiny in terms of, you know, we all know what your ultimate goal is. Could you be derailed by something like that? Because obviously you have to be concerned about your own self as well as your family as primary, even though this is so detrimentally important. Um, well, I'm not that effective if I'm dead. I'm, I know that. Um, right. And, you know, carrying on this mission, uh, the m- one of the mission objectives is not to get me killed. Um, so, but at the, at, at the same token, somebody had to grab the flag. And I was, uh, for my family, I was the best person to go ahead and do that. Um, you know, because I... Um, you know, going going back to 2008, 2009, 
what kicked everything off was um, an NBC5 uh, news interview. And my brother was in uh, southern Wisconsin, and I was in Texas. And I called him, and I'm like, hey, look, one of us has to go do this interview, and you're right there. So do you mind handling that? And he said, hell yeah, I mind. I'm like, well, what's your problem? He's like, I got kids. I'm like, that is a very good point right there. So, right. yeah, I, I'm mindful of what it is that we were doing and what we were uh, taking on, and I had to grab that flag no matter what. I mean, that's just what I had to do. Sure. That makes perfect sense as far as I'm thinking. That's, I was, that was going to, you actually answered one of my questions because I was going to say to you, because I know that you have other family members, how integral they were in terms of um, helping to gain justice for this, but you kind of answered that question there. Um, because sometimes it can become a whole family cumulative sort of effort um, to get to where you need to go. Well, they, you know, um, I, I talk to my brother Mike a lot. Uh, you know, he he's the smart one out of all of us. I do pretty good on my own, but he, he kind of blows me away. Sure. Um, so I always wanted okay. to run interference by him. Um, but at the same uh, token, you know, the family knew who had lead with this, and I'm sure everybody was comfortable with the idea that I was going to be tenacious enough to get to the bottom of it. The only concern that they have is to make sure I wouldn't get killed in that process. Of course. None of us wants to see you get harmed or injured. I mean, nobody should become no. a casualty due to something that's, you know, right and necessary and, and with great purpose, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, my father has Canada nothing to do with getting his oldest son killed, so. Well, exactly. That's exactly correct. You're right. Um, this is an interesting question. I usually tend to ask, um, I ask this of all what I call, because I'm doing this whole mob month thing, so to speak, and so you kind of follow along the lines of this. Recently, and I know that you've seen this, and we've all kind of seen this, this upcoming uh, series called Hit Women, which kind of hints at being bad to gain good. So this is what I want to ask you. In today's quote-unquote TV land, viewers ventured to appease their allure towards this whole magnetism of the mafia. So my, my general question to you is, why do you think so many people are so drawn to get every little detail about people that have been associated to this lifestyle? Gotcha. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, it, there, there's a human nature to it, um, to where, you know, we all revere power and influence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and how many times have we ran into a little situation that we wish we had uh, – you know, uh, an Uncle Sonny or something like that to go take care of that for us. So I, I think we right. kind of all fantasize a little bit about that, also with the human nature of, uh, you know, people with power and influence. Um, you know, and I, I think with the mob, uh, whether it's true or false, we're intrigued by the traditions, the... Um, the standards, the uh, the unspoken laws, you know, and, uh, you know, the discipline of an entity like the mob. Um, so I, I, mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's really quite human to be intrigued by the mafia. Good answer. I would have to concur with that, you know, because and nowadays every time I turn around there's always a new entity, of course, mob-wise, and then you've got, of course, this hit women that's coming out. There's a whole lot of mafia sort of stuff out there and going on, but I'm always going back to the whole people like you sort of stance. This is real life. Yeah. This is real happening. These are real, you know, right. this is the real deal. I mean, there's some, you know, I mean, there's some legitimacy to the people out there, but yet getting to the real heart of it I think is really intriguing and fascinating. So kudos to you for coming on my show because I'm so excited. I get to expose the real people. Yay. I love it. It's <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you okay. for having me. Well, you're quite welcome, actually. Now we're going to go to the personal points of things. I always do a little personal points section because, like I said, most people all the time will look at you as your mainstay, which is being an author and what you're infamous for, but they don't realize that Paul's like a real guy, real person, um, who has real interests and things like that. So there's a couple different things that I picked out um, that I want to talk about uh, on a personal side of things. Are you ready? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. First of all, there's this little rumor that's running around that Paul intends to initiate um, – taking guitar lessons. So I was intrigued to ask you if you are a absolutely magnificent musician that's been playing and, and doing this for years or just a novice or talk to me a little bit about the musical side of things. I'm horrible. 
but but I love it. I love it. Um, I I I started playing the guitar oh probably about four or five years ago. Um, but when things started picking up with the book and and the blogging and stuff. I had to kind of forego my lessons. I, I wasn't uh, managing both well, so I had to put the guitar down for a little bit. Um, but I, I I love the guitar. It, it, it's a great creative outlet. Um, I I love when I do learn something that you know was kind of beating me up, chewing me up, and then tackling it and getting getting across the finish line with it. So yeah, I, I love the okay. guitar. I'm horrible, but I, I love it. So it's a work in progress. At some given point in time, you'll right. actually take lessons and you'll get good. Oh, wonderful. How exciting. I look forward to that. That's awesome. Okay. I also happen to notice, and I was so happy to find this out, that I'm actually hosting, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, that, yes, indeed, you are a fellow non-packer backer. Is that correct? Because I'm in Wisconsin. That, 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 that's that's absolutely correct. Up. That's absolutely yeah. correct. Okay. Now, is that because... Is that because you're originally, you know, obviously Illinois has this whole revelry, you know, just like Minnesota does against us. Is it just because you're from there, meaning from Illinois, or is there just some other particular reason why you don't like our team? No, no, I just grew up knowing that the next best thing to a Bears win is a Packers loss. So that's just that's just the way it is. I like that's just the way it is. That's awesome. Yeah, I yeah, I noticed that. We take a lot of flack and such. And some of my best friends are Packer fans, and it causes a lot of controversy. I get in a lot of arguments with personal friends. I mean, I post a lot of them, they don't like them, and they don't like it. It happens, <laughs> especially like if you're living on that border of Illinois and Wisconsin. Well, exactly. There you go. Yeah. So good. You get another point because of that. You get a point because of the music thing. You get a point All because right. of the non-Packer backer thing. This is awesome. All okay, right. Okay, next question for you. I happen to notice that you carry a camaraderie for a gentleman by the name of Nick Sheridan. And I know at one particular point in time there was a campaign on there for um, him from a medical standpoint in terms of funds and things like that, which kind of touched me because I see that's not the first time you've actually, you know, you did another whole post about a friend of yours who had a, uh, not a GoFundMe campaign, but an actual campaign for charity type things. Um, So I was just curious to find out about your friend Nick, if he ever got the funds or what the status of that was. Um, well, I, I, I think he, he, he's still working on it. He, he was able to get a lot of money. Okay. And uh, Nick, he, he, he lost both of his legs and his arm. Um, right. He had uh, meningitis when, uh, uh, I think when he was in his late teens. I know I just got out of the Marine Corps, uh, maybe early 20s, actually. And, um, and meningitis can be very, very severe. And, um, and he was losing parts of him uh, going through this, and he wasn't expected to live, but uh, Nick pulled on through, and if you ever met my friend Nick, he, he's the life of the party. He, he doesn't stop anything, you know, stop from, from doing anything. He, he uh, races uh, sprint cars, you know, go, go ahead and try to do that with two arms and two legs, um, and he's doing that with one arm and uh, three, three mechanical appendages. And, uh, yeah, Nick's an awesome guy. Um, I, I, I like doing things um, for for people, things that, that touch my heart. You know, it, it, it takes a lot to make this world go around. There's a lot of stories, a lot of important stories that never get heard and that type of thing. Uh, so if something touches me, then, yeah, I'm, I'm in on it. Awesome. Which stands to reason i got to ask the next question on that side of things. If I were to ask Paul... Do you have any sort of personal um, charities or or particular things that you have a heart for in terms of things that you support on a charity side of things? No, not 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 in particular. Um, you know, things that okay. are uh, close to me are um, things uh, pertaining to justice, things pertaining to our military. Uh, you know, okay. and then just any of any of those tear jerking type of stories. Um, but I, I don't associate with any one particular thing. It, it's it's the individual okay. story that inspires me most, uh, but those are the type of things that I do get involved in. I understand perfectly. Thank you. Now, um, another thing on your page that I noticed this as well, um, you had kind of spoken of your 
for lack of a better term, glee, I should say, for um, Gangland Wire, which is, of course, produced by our mutual pal, Gary Jenkins. So let's talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind just letting the listeners know of the reason for your raving about this particular DVD, et cetera, because I know very little. I'm sure right. most people listening don't know very little. So let's talk about that just a bit. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I really loved about Gangland Wire is it taught me so much stuff. Um, it, it's it's hard for me uh, to to learn new things about the mob, particularly the Chicago outfit. Um, I'm pretty well versed in it, so you know I'll go ahead and I'll buy a book, and you know out of uh, you know every hundred pages of a book, there may be two pages in there that you know I find interesting and new. Well, Gangland Wire was just the opposite of that. Um, every there was almost hardly anything in there that I that I knew other than uh, a few of the mobsters and uh, a couple of the trials, the Straw Man 1, Straw Man 2. And um, Gary Jenkins, mm-hmm. uh, Jenkins is the producer of Gangland Wire. And what Gangland Wire is all about is, if you're familiar with the movie Casino, um, you'll see in the movie Casino, it was the mobsters in Kansas City that kept records of everything and actually took the skim money and uh, delivered it to all the families across the country. And um, and the movie Casino is, is true. Uh, some some things are taken out of context here and there, but all the events and stuff that you see in that movie, they're true. They're actually happened. And Gary Jenkins was um, part of the Kansas City Intelligence Group that was um, putting a wire on the guys in Kansas City and they were actually listening in to hear about some murders and bombings that were going on in Kansas City, but they wound up picking up what was going on in Las Vegas, and that was the Las Vegas scam, and basically everything about what the movie Casino was about. Um, so not only is Gary Jenkins a producer of Gangland Wire that touches on that subject, he was an actual investigating officer back there, too. Um, so you have really a unique combination of a, a producer who's actually in the know, who's in the inside circle of this. And he, and he tells the story of Kansas City, of uh, Kansas City and Las Vegas, Kansas City and Chicago, and he, and he tells this incredible story. That's what I thought. And I was just looking to the temporary stuff today. Like I was going through and kind of, I just friended him, and we got to know each other, started talking to each other. He's actually going to be a guest on my show as well. Um, and just kind of oh, feeling through and looking at all that good stuff. So I'm intrigued. I'm very intrigued to kind of see what um, the backstory is on all of that, get more into depth on that, what people know, listeners know in terms of what that's all about. But thank you. I figured we could just kind of give an intro into all that good stuff. Um, so the other personal question that I wanted to ask you is, um, so on Paul's downtime, not that you have any, <laughs> what would we find you doing? Yeah, right. What do you enjoy? What 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 are those things Oof. that you love doing? Well, you know, I you know, for me, I, I'm still kind of coming out of my campaign a little bit. Uh, I've definitely been taking a breather, okay. um, and you know, I've been evol- involved in this stuff for God, going on uh, almost six years now. Um, so I'm kind of. Okay getting to the point of redefining who I am. You know, right now, you know, I really don't know too much, you know. I know that I like playing the guitar, um, so I definitely plan on picking that up uh, again. But I think um, I'll have more time for reading. And, you know, I'm just figuring things out. I mean, you know, I don't I want to say I put my entire life on hold for the last few years, but um, my mission did take a big part of it. So... Um, and it can't always be that way. So we're, we're getting to the point where we'll, we'll be transitioning back into Paul, who I've always been. That's what I'm looking forward to. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, because a lot of times I know people get so, and I know I'm in the thick of it with my career, it's like you can't lose sight of who you are and what you were before all of this. You know, and I'm, I've been trying right. to kind of get back to that point, so I know you're talking about. Um, okay. So we're going to get into, there's a series of different questions about murder in McHenry. But the first thing I want to ask is, um, the book itself possesses a partnership, meaning that there's both you and um, Keith Bettinger, meaning both of your co-authors. So give us the the why, the when, and the how of how that happened, because obviously some people may not know how you merged together to do this. Right, right. Well, um, you you know, in my story, um, you know, I... 
was working with uh, Denny Griffin, and we were talking about who's one of my favorite mobster off- authors, and it was Denny Griffin. And uh, I became good friends with Denny over uh, a year period of time. And um, and he helped me kind of campaign awareness about my father's story. And um, when we got the killer of my father named, we, um, you know, I felt like that was the time to maybe consider writing a book. So I originally asked Denny. And um, and he was in the midst of uh, his book at that time, Surviving the Mob, uh, which was the uh, biography of a, a Gambino guy named Andrew D. Donato. And um, so he didn't have time to do a book with me. And um, well, I, I asked him, well, do you, do you, can you find somebody? I have no idea of what to look for, you know, in an author. And so he did. Um, he asked his very good friend, Keith Bettinger. That was the first name he gave me. I talked to Keith. And uh, me and him went ahead and cut a deal on a verbal handshake over the phone. And uh, we went to town. We went and did business. And Keith, of course, has done more than one publication outside of yours. Is that correct, if I'm not that's, mistaken? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Keith was okay, already a published said. author. Gotcha. Nice. Nice to know. Okay. Well, let me just give a little bit of a backstory here in case um, people that are listening in may not know. Um, at the early age of uh, 11, you had lost um, your father. Murder in McHenry is a publication of your pursuit to guarantee the man responsible for murder was known and named, of course. And this case continued unsolved for 27 years. So the very first question that I want to ask you is, is maybe kind of describe her or or just go into a little bit in terms of the influx of emotion that you eventually had to endure through this torture of losing your loved one in this manner. I mean, it's not a natural cause of death. Obviously, right. there's much complication here, and I can I can only imagine. Just kind of put us in your world a little bit and and share with us what that's like from the emotional standpoint of things. Yeah, right, gotcha. Um, but, I mean, I just wasn't ready for it you know you you know uh when you you find out that your father was murdered and you're you're just a kid um there's nothing that you know readies you for that um but i i had such a you know i call it the brady bunch life you know you know i got bikes for birthdays and christmas and i lived in a great neighborhood had a lot of friends um just you know like a very naive uh uh, aimable little boy, and then one day it wasn't that anymore. Um, you know, my my father was killed on June second, nineteen eighty one. Um, I uh, was taken home from school early that day. I didn't know why. Um, waiting for my mom to get home, and then uh, my mom came home, and uh, you know, basically we uh, had a bunch of cars like a caravan of cars pull up in our driveway, and we had a big U-turn driveway. We had about five cars pull up, and somebody else was driving my mom's car, which was like a big no-no, and you know, back then. Uh, and then she came out of a Crown Vic, and um, and all, all the whole caravan were a bunch of cops and stuff. And, uh, and she's like, your father was kid, and that's all she could get out, but we understood what had happened, and um, mm-hmm. it, it just it twisted my world. Um, everything changed. It, it, it was different. I I couldn't. Uh, I, I didn't even relate to myself anymore. You know, and, you know who I was before I ran into my mom to who I was at that moment of running into my mom became vastly different. And you know, and over the short hours or short days after that fact. I was getting further and further away from who I was, this naive, innocent, aimable, happy-go-lucky little boy to uh, somebody that was, you know, devastated, miserable, very angry. Um, And, you know, the the little boy who who I was... um, I I write about this in my book. You know, when, when I was growing up, everybody called me PJ. When I was born, my dad said, you know, I'm calling him PJ and told my mom to fill in the blanks, you know, and so I became Paul Joseph. I didn't even know my name was Paul Joseph until I was seven. 
because uh, everybody called me PJ. Oh. And on on that day of June second, nineteen eighty one, um, n- other than my mother and my brothers, nobody called me PJ anymore. And, and it really was kind of fitting uh, to the fact that you know PJ was dying. You know, there's this news that 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 PJ got about his father. He couldn't handle any of this business. He couldn't live with it. And I talk about that transition of the you know from PJ and becoming Paul. Um, because literally people stopped calling me PJ, and um, and, the, and it was also a kind of a metamorphosis uh, transformation of who I was becoming to deal with the fact that my father was killed. And, um, you know, I'm very happy to be Paul, but I was meant to be PJ. And um, PJ doesn't have any coarse edges to him. Paul has a few coarse edges to him. Um, so in writing my book, I, I, I kind of related to that and realized that I never mourned the loss of PJ, and there that was a loss to be mourned. Um, so it was tragic, Cindy. Sure, I imagine it was. Yeah, heartbreaking. I would think a lot of yeah, you know, absolutely. like that last but this influx of emotions, you know, anger and frustration and sadness and you know shock, like you're talking about. Because I, I yeah. can't even imagine, um, you know. It, it, that's just it, it really changes the course of who you are, and, and I can't. And I'm just going to assume that you know that, that the man you are now may may have been very different had all of this not right. happened. That, 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 that's that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, I'm uh, friends with uh, uh, a gentleman named uh, Nick, and uh, Nick his, his father was killed by the mob uh, back in the early '70s. And, um, and you know, and I, I, I see things, we, we get along great. Um, and, mm-hmm. and the reason for it, we have a lot in common. And so it's like I, I pick up on some of the things that I think now that I understand is I'm this way because of what happened back in the day. I had nothing to, you know, nobody else to bounce things off of. Uh, but, it, yeah, you don't you don't know what you lost. You can't, you know know what what it is that you never had. Um, but you know you lost something. And that, that's part of who I am. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I do think that there's something to be said, and I've talked to other people, where death of a loved one has either weakened them, and in this particular case, I believe when I look at you, that they've strengthened them because you carry the voice and the will of your parent in, in your head and in your heart, which I believe is what keeps you going. And again, that's just an yeah. assumption, but I would think that that's your main motivator. Yeah, no, I, yeah, absolutely. And you know, and I've, uh, you know, I I know some of the people that have been crushed. Um, one of, one of the things about revisiting this, you know, because I I dealt with this tragedy back in 1981 as a little boy, and then I dealt with this tragedy again in 2008 uh, when I found out who mur- you know who murdered my father, and you know, back in mm-hmm. 1981. It was all about PJ and Paul. You know, no, there's nobody that's having life worse than me right now. And all I could think of was me. Where going ahead and um, uh, rediscovering this tragedy and going through it again, I realized, oh my God, there's victims everywhere because of that day. Um, and, uh, and it bothered me a lot. You know, it made me carry that flag just a little bit higher because a lot of people. They they didn't change from that day. They 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 stayed on that day, and um, right. you know that and that's that's bad news. You know that's bad news, and that's what you know happens to people. It, you know we're we're all human. We're not all meant to take on tragedies uh, such as these, and they 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 have devastating effects on people. And even the people that you talk about that do find strength in their tragedy. They they're still devastated. There's still a part of them that's devastated. Of course, and I'm not so sure that that goes away. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, because yeah. I, I see that as a running trend too, where you just kind of learn to live with it, not necessarily accept it 100, percent but just learn to live with it. Um, so yeah. another yeah, reason why I like it so that, much. There's there, there's certain things in life that happen that they only get so good. And then, you know, and, and when you've worked it the best that you can, now you have to fit it into the context of your life so that you can continue with life with having something, a part of you that's a little broken. 
and you know, and, that, and right. that's where you you make the adjustments. Of course, makes sense. Okay, um, on to the next set of questions. Obviously, as you had prefaced, June second, nineteen eighty one. Of course, your father being the age of thirty seven years old, which is of course the day in which this occurred, along with Patricia Freeman as well. Um, as you stated at the PM pub, a couple different questions. Um, First off, I was curious to ask you if you've maintained an ongoing kinship and or relationship with the Freeman family. Um, well, I, I do talk to Paula every every now and then. Um, I really didn't know Paul and Robert. Paul and Robert are uh, Patricia's uh, uh, son and daughter. And I really didn't know them going up, but I, I know a lot of their family. Um Sure. Because where where this tragedy happened, it was part of McHenry, but an, uh, an incorporated part of McHenry called Lakemore. And I would say yeah, Lakemore at that time was like a community of about 800 people, um, but I'm pretty sure like at least 400 of them was related to Patricia Freeman. Um, so I, I, I know quite a bit of the family, but... Um, I'm in very little contact with uh, Robert and Paula. I'm probably in contact with Paula more than Robert. Um, sure. And, uh, and, and we, we reach out to each other every now and then. Gotcha. Okay. Now, second question for you. Um, had there been what we would call anticipatory events in terms of prior to the moment in which your father, of course, was gone down. Um, were there any anticipatory events that might have been indicative of something was going to go awry? Was there any kind of warning? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Sometimes people yeah. have the sense of things, or there would have been some premonition or whatever. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, um, I mean, certainly not for me. I, you know, I was a, a little boy. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, right. I wouldn't have known right. anything. I, you know, I was uh, when when my dad was killed on June second, nineteen eighty one. I was ten. Um, on June 5th was the first day of his wake. That was also my birthday, and I turned 11. Right. And um, and and so uh, maybe kind of give a little bit of background on how how I got here a little. So my my father was gone down okay. on June 2nd, 1981, at our bar, the PM Pub in Lakemore, and um, we were giving uh, a suspect, but ultimately the case went cold for 27 years. And um, my former babysitter was driving her father um, from Illinois back down to Arkansas. And on the way, she asked her father, hey, who do you think killed Ron? And um, her dad, Jim Hager, uh, was my dad's best friend. So he mentioned Glenn, who was the suspect that we always had. Then he mentioned a guy named Larry Newman. And um, so Holly went back home and started Googling Larry Newman. Well, he came up on a serial killer site, and he was from McHenry. And then she found a book called Collada, and that's the book on Frank Collada, who was um, a mobster who turned government witness, who uh, actually, if you've seen the movie Casino, he was the technical advisor for Casino. And the character Joe Pesci um, played... Uh, a guy named Nicky Santoro, but that was actually based on Tony Spilatro from Chicago. And and that's who Frank's boss was, was Tony Spilatro. Um, so she came across that book, and then on page 130 of Frank's book, it told me who killed my father, um, and it was Larry Newman. And so that's how um, I, I reached out to Frank's co-author, uh, who is Denny Griffin, and there's my bias. Uh, that's why I'm a big fan of Denny. Uh, and I told him, hey, you know, you've got an unsolved double homicide in your book here. And that's when, you know, we started reaching out to each other, started figuring out some things, some things that, were, that weren't right during that investigation. And we figured out the sheriff's office was hooked to the Chicago outfit. But back to your question is, was there any any flares that kind of went off that may have told us that something was going to happen to my father, and mm-hmm. it certainly was. Um, Larry Newman was, uh, his, his nickname was Lurch, uh, as from the guy of the Adams family, not because he was lovable, but because he was big. Um, I would guess him to be right. about 6'6", six, six, somewhere around there, but a big man, not a skinny 6'6 six, six guy, like a full-fledged very physical specimen of a person, six six uh, guy, and you know they called him Lurch, and um, 
And he was part of the Hole in the Wall gang. And the Hole in the Wall gang is referenced in the movie Casino. They got that name because of the way that they committed robberies. Back then, there were alarm systems and stuff, uh, but there was very few, if any, motion detectors back in the day. So they would wire around the doors. They would wire around the windows. So what these guys would do is punch a hole through the wall or punch a hole through the roof, and that's how they would penetrate buildings that they were going to rob. Well, Larry Newman was part of that, and Larry Newman was friends with my dad. Um, and uh, so Larry went to Las Vegas with Frank, and you know, and that's where the movie Casino takes takes off to. And uh, back at home, uh, Larry's ex-wife, uh, her name was Debbie, uh, would come to the bar. Well, on a particular night, she was very drunk, and she was hitting on my father. And, um, and you know, my father didn't take any loss of control in his bar. Because, you know, once the patron starts losing control, right. you lose the whole entire ship. Um, so he, he threw her out of the bar. Well, there, there, it, it went badly. Um, you know, she was screaming and yelling, being more belligerent. I'm going to go get some people. And she came back with people and... You know, back in those days, there was guns on both sides of the fence with this. And uh, and my dad felt like this was going to be a problem. My dad felt like he was going to have to deal with Larry Newman. And uh, a couple weeks later, he did. That was very poignant. <clears throat> yeah. As we know, of course... At least I know because I've read the book. Obviously, not everybody has, and it's a great backstory. We were, I was actually going to bring up Frank, as a matter of fact, on the whole page 130 thing. And the one thing that I wanted to ask you about was um, what a surreal experience it was for you to meet Frank in person. I mean, what was yeah. that experience like? And, of course, I know you continue with a friendship now. So um, what's that like? Um, because he's instrumental in ways, of course. Um, right, he right. Not, of helping you. right. Well, I, you know, um, you know, me and Frank have been on like a couple of radio shows and stuff before we we actually met mm-hmm. face to face, and um, right. you know, and, and if, you, if you're into the mobster thing, you know who Frank Colada is. Um, yeah, he he was an outfit associate, um, but he was tied to the leadership of the Chicago outfit primarily through Tony Spilatro. Um, but he, you know, he, he knew, uh, everybody in the outfit, you know, he, he grew up in, uh, in the neighborhoods where, you know, the outfit had their farm team and, uh, and, and where they grew out to become, uh, from gangsters to mobsters and that type of thing. So Frank has always been part of that life. And, uh, and if you're into the mob, uh, meeting Frank is, you know, kind of an unreal thing. Um, and then, and then you got this involvement uh, that him and I have because of his book, and you know, and everything that he's tried to do. Um, you know, and, and and if you look at everything that's happened, the one constant in the story is uh, Frank Lotta always tried to keep Ron Sharp alive. Uh, and uh, back in the day, when Debbie Newman called Larry back at Las Vegas, uh, that was at. Uh, Frank Collada's restaurant, the Upper Crust, and that's when she she told Larry that my dad grabbed her by the neck and threw her out of the bar, and that's not what happened. And uh, but she knew how to okay. push his button stuff, and so he gets back to the table and he's in a rage, you know. And Frank's asking him what the problem is, and he's you know telling him you know this guy you know he he, he threw my ex wife out of the bar, you know grabbed her by the neck and everything. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Frank's like, well, is she okay? And, yeah, she's fine. Mm -hmm. Well, let's leave it Mm -hmm. alone. She's an ex-wife for a reason, you know? Just leave it alone. Right. And so, you know, ever since that, you know, Frank didn't know who my father was or anything like that. It was bad for business, you know. And um, But, you know, Frank tried keeping my father alive then. And then um, in 1982, when he turned government witness, he tried telling the cops, who killed my father? So Frank's always been the constant mm-hmm. in my life, whether I knew it or not, that I was either trying to keep my father alive or trying to tell the cops who who killed my father. 
because he, uh, he did it right. back in 1982, and he did it again back in 2008 and 2009. Um, so, mm-hmm. so uh, for me, the first time I met Frank was uh, almost uh, a year into knowing him, you know, doing a couple radio shows with him, and I'm meeting him face-to-face. Well, I'm a mob enthusiast just like everybody else. You know, I'm from Chicago. And I got Frank Collada coming to pick me up to go do a radio show. I'm ready to have the time of my life, you know. And so um, so Frank calls me. He tells me he's downstairs, and I'm excited. And I'm all pumped up. And so I run downstairs to go ahead and meet him. I open up the car. I uh, go ahead and shake his hand. He puts his hand out. And then when he went to shake my hand, he grabbed my hand, and he pushed me, pulled me close, closer into him so I would lock eyes with him. Mm-hmm. And the very first thing that he said to me is, he said, hey, Paul, I want you to know that I did everything that I could so your father would be alive today. Everything. And I was kind of taken off guard by that a little bit because that wasn't the day that I was having. <laughs> you know, I'm having a very excitable right. long day. Oh, sure. And, and, right. uh, and I looked at him and I said, I know, Frank. I know. And then I sat in the car and I'm like, man, i got to figure out a way to turn this around because this is not what today is going to be about. And I can pick up um, where Frank was coming from. you know. And I know as being a Marine, if I was talking to somebody like that, what I think was going on is one of my Marines did something that was very wrong, and i got to take responsibility for it as their leader. And I think that's kind of what Frank was doing with – the Larry, that he was taking responsibility for the actions of Larry. And, you know, and, and, you know, again, from that Marine perspective, then I have to work on me. Did I do everything I could to make sure that that Marine wouldn't do what he did? And if the answer is yes, then I kind of need to let myself off the hook. Yeah, I took responsibility for it. That's what I need right. to do. But I also did everything I could to make sure that Marine got it right. And And, and, and I didn't think Frank did that second part. I think he kept himself on the hook for that. And um, and so sure. we went to do this radio show, and, you know, and, and, and things turn around. We're getting along and stuff like that. And um, and so he just got done telling the story about how he killed this guy, Jerry Lisner. And, you know, and he wasn't remorseful about it whatsoever. And all of a sudden the host asks uh, Frank, so what is it like to be in the same room as a victim? And usually when I'm doing radio shows, and especially back then, because I felt like so much was on the line, that basically I was sitting on the right. uh, the phone or in the studio going, not talking to me, not talking to me, talking to me, talking to me, talking to me, and making sure that I answered that sure. question the best that I could. Well, this question threw me off. Right. I was like, oh, man, that's a good question. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. Go with it. And he's like, Quite honestly, it makes me a little uneasy. And I was like, oh, man. And I'm like, how, how are you uneasy? I thought we were doing great. He's like, honestly, he goes, you know, I've been spending the morning with the kid. The kid's all right. He's a good kid. It's getting better. So, you know, that, right. that was our, our, our first time meeting. And, and things did get better. Uh, he wound up taking me to breakfast and stuff after we did the radio show. And we were just hanging out, you know, just mm-hmm. being guys, talking guy stuff. Nice. Very cool. I have yet to meet him, actually. I'm kind of nervous. (laughs) I'm nervous. Oh, well, no (laughs) reason. He he looks very intimidating. He does. Well, you know, I mean, he's a gangster, you know? I mean, he is very quintessential. (laughs) What you expect, a mobster from Chicago to maybe look like, be like, it's Frank. Um, But, you know, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. You'll 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 have a great time mm-hmm. meeting him, and uh, and I, I, I'm yeah. sure he'll, he'll he'll go out of his way to make you sure that uh, you're you're warm and welcome. Right, and I've noticed that actually from a lot of the people that I've met, um, you know, who have done the whole, you know, or either have family members that are in the mafia, were in the mafia, that sort of good stuff. Um, you know, there's always that intimidating factor, and then you go and you meet them, and it's like, oh my God, these are real. You know, I just met Big Ann Johnson so long ago, and she's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I mean, not a prima donna, not a diva. She's wonderful. You know, um, I met our mutual friend, Susan, which is leading up to what I have to say to you, because Susan and I had a sure. conversation about you today. Oh, um, wow. 
And so I said, tell me, tell me something about Paul that I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm cheating. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I researched him up, down, and sideways, but I'm like, tell me something I don't know. And she said that you were the real deal and that you were genuine and that you were very sweet and that you were very well-intended and that you had a purpose um, and you were very passionate about said purpose and that she found that incredibly refreshing. Um, I, I value Susan's opinion more than I can tell you. She is, I've just, I met her recently and I took her out as my mom. I mean, so she's my pseudo mom. Yeah, I mean, right. that's family right there. And so when, when she talks like that, it means a great deal to me. Um, and she she just, she speaks very, very highly of you. And I was hoping she'd be able to get us to call in. I gave her the phone number. And, of course, she can't. She's under the weather. She's not feeling well. So she wanted me to send her sentiments to you and say that uh, she thinks you're a remarkable human being. And um, oh. she's very happy to know you. Yeah, I mean, well, well, I, you know, that, that's you. a real high compliment coming from Susan. Yes, it is. Um, you know, yes. you know I, I was talking about my father kind of being old school, you know, and Susan comes from that, that same cut of cloth. And yes, so when, yep. when when I have somebody comp like that complimenting me, um, you know, wow, you you know you're you're doing something right, you know. And and, and really that's kind of what this is all about, you know, is to uh do the right thing, you know, to make sure that the right things happen. You know, I mean, whether you look at this story that I have as a blessing or not, I do look at it as a blessing, you know, because, you know, the the first 27 years was your, your father's gone down and nobody cares, right? So mm-hmm. now right. I, I have the story that makes a whole lot of sense of my, my father being gone. and And I understand that. Not everybody's tragedy has a crazy story, you know, but there is right. a good chance that somebody else's tragedy could run into some of the stuff that, that my family ran into back in McHenry County. McHenry right. County is outside of Chicago. Right. Uh, Illinois is one of the most corrupt states in the whole country, if not the most corrupt state in the country. McHenry County is no different. Well, it's a little different because... Cook County, DuPage County, Lake County, the Department of Justice has come out to all those places. But the Department of Justice has never made its way to McHenry County. So you've had corruption that's continued on there, you know, unfettered for years and years. Um, I'm sorry, I I don't even know what I was making my point was with that, but, uh, you know, I I just started picking up on the the corruption thing (laughs) in in McHenry County. (laughs) This is is what people are going to have to deal with. Right? And so if I don't take my ability to tell this story that does bring people in and listen, and it's the people's power of them listening that I get things done, I've got to take advantage of this. Because the next person that has to deal with the tragedy, and there will be somebody, unfortunately, they shouldn't have to deal with what I dealt with or what my family had dealt with, uh, with the corruption, the cover-ups, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I just went out on broadcast and started hammering these people out. And quite frankly, they made it easy for me. You know, the, the, the one thing about corruption, especially when it's been festering for decades like it was in McHenry County, people get sloppy, careless. And they operate in this the world of corruption, which is normal method of operations. Um, so when, when you get on them, it, it wasn't that hard. It wasn't that hard to go ahead and say, yeah, look, look what we're dealing with here. Look what we're dealing with here. And, um, and I actually had a few guys that were taken on um, under Sheriff Sankey, Sheriff Nigren. They were taking them on before me, and a couple of them were deputies too. So they were the ones that, uh, you know, the, the regime, I called them, we're calling. They're crazy. They don't know what they were talking about. They're the ones that had to sit there and tell their story over and over again, and and try to get people to believe them. By the time I got onto the scene, the people were prepped. The people are like, "Yeah, there's definitely some problems going on." So all I had to do was tell the story. Um, so there there was a few things that that I had working for me that I was going to um, use to help make things better for the next victim that comes up. And we did. We did some really good work, I think. And continuing to do so, obviously, because your journey is not, you know, it's not like you're coming in here and saying, hey, we're done, da 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 and all that good stuff. So, yeah, I would have to agree with that. Um, 
question I'm for you done. before we I'm get not, to I'm our last question. Well, yeah, sure. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was no, no, going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm not that. done. I'm, I'm getting, I, I'm seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel here, but I'm not done. I've been, I've been working right. on this for about six years. And um, we didn't root out corruption out of McHenry County, but we made sure the regime took a big hit. Um, Andrew Zanke, we, we sent him packing. Um, we got a new sheriff in McHenry County. And, um, and over the year and a half or so, I've become friends with the, the new sheriff. And uh, I wasn't going to support anybody, you know, because it was McHenry County. And, uh, you know, I wasn't going right. to go and, and go from one corrupt guy to another. I was just going to hammer on this guy and make sure people had knowledge when they would go to the voting booth. So I wound up becoming friends with uh, Bill Prim, who was running for uh, sheriff as well. And the reason why um, I reached out to him, it, it was because, believe it or not, I had a lot of McHenry County deputies who supported me which kind of blew me away. I was like, what the hell? Right. But when I think about right. it, what, what, what's worse than dealing with these guys? Oh, maybe working for these guys. And I was like, oh, of course, no. <laughs> right. these, 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 these guys are really a natural alliance I had. Um, so these guys were uh, reaching out to me anonymously, you know, because they, they were telling me who they were, but they couldn't publicly support me because of who they worked for. And they kept on mentioning Bill Pramp, Bill Pramp, Bill Pramp. So um, that's when I started looking into things and um, and got to know who Bill Prim was and then reached out to his campaign, let them know that, you know, I wanted to help and support them. And um, But over the last year and a half, uh, me and Bill become uh, good friends, and uh, and we, we made some real good positive change in the McHenry County Sheriff's Office. That that was a big, big deal, big deal, even noted by the Chicago Tribune. They didn't know me by name, but they they noted by the the work that uh, I and a couple others were doing. And it's and it's amazing work. I mean, any kind of heart work, which is what I call it, is the most amazing stuff to ever do. I mean, anything that involves your heart, your soul, your family, anything that has a sizable difference or makes a sizable difference, is amazing. Um, all the more reason I like you. Um, but I think I said that before, but I think it's just fundamentally important that people step outside of themselves and have a greater good and a greater purpose. And, and you've established that um, in right. doing what you've been doing. Um, so yeah, my give, question give, give, uh, my last question to somebody else. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, it's about giving, um, not doing it for yourself, doing it for others. Be unselfish exactly. about it. And that's exactly that's where right. Come out. Yes. And I totally gravitate to people such as yourself who do that, who, you know, because I, you know, we both know individuals who, um, you know, you get into the entertainment, quote-unquote, industry, there's a side of it that's factual, and then there's a side that's the entertainment sort of thing and such, because you can kind of fall along that guideline. Um, and there are a lot of phonies that are out there in the world. There are a lot of people that take advantage of, they have one little detail and embellish it and make it much larger than it is. So it's, it's nice right. to see genuine, it's nice to see authentic, you know what I mean? Um, right, I did right. want to ask though because I don't, I can't remember if I knew the answer to this question. Um, the PM pub itself um, is no longer in existence. Is it still there? I guess I wanted to ask no. that question because I wasn't certain of the answer. No, no, it was um, it, the, the PM right. pub was an old building. I, I, I want to say maybe uh, a twenty style um, building. And I want to say around the mid-80s, mid-90s, we sold the bar to a gentleman. That gentleman passed. Um, the family had an opportunity to sell the bar to the city, um, and that's what they did. And they they knocked the bar down, and, and it's a parking lot. Oh, look at that. And, that, and that's yeah. the, uh, that was the other question I wanted to ask. When you go back there... Um, do you go there, or is that still very difficult for you? No, you know, um, you know, I, I went back there weeks and, you know, after my father was killed. Uh, I mean, I, I, I remember, and I write about this in my book, going in the, in the back room, the apartment behind the bar, and, right. um, and right. noticing the blood splatter that was still left on uh, some of the wood trim and things like that, you know, and, and, and dealing with the fact, like, oh, my God, that's my father. You know, that's my father right there. And having to deal with that, you know, as being an 11-year-old boy. Uh, and I, I think, um, you know, 
I, I went back to the bar not because my mom thought that was the best entertaining thing that she could do for her children. We didn't have options. She had to go back to the bar. She had to open that place back up. We had to go with, and that was it. And but right. because of those right. circumstances, um, I would say, you know what, that bar could have easily been a place of this earth that I wouldn't want to walk on to. But because we had to do what we had to do, uh, there's not a place on this earth that I won't walk on. And I'm glad that that place didn't become one. So it, it was, you know, I write about this in my book that, you know, the biggest thing that I've taken away from this, that's a big part of me, is you got a problem, deal with it right up the middle. Run it right up the middle. Right. It's, uh, it's the biggest right. bang. It's, it's where it's going to pop to you the hardest. Um, but if you stay in there, you've dealt with it. You've taken care of business. You've wrapped it up, and you're ready to move forward. So that's why I always attack things head on because of experiences like that. Wonderful. So this is my question to you. Um, obviously, to those that may not know this, uh, Newman actually passed in January of 2007. And I know that the right. two main objectives you've had are to have him named as a perpetrator and, of course, be given some form of an explanation why the public, or excuse me, the police had never uh, went after him. So just talk a bit about um, the steps and successes that you've taken up to this point in time today. Just kind of give people the, the, the feel for where are you at, what have you accomplished so far, and what do you have left to do in terms of seeking justice or getting what you need to get? Sure. Well, you know, I, I would I would have to say that my success is beyond imagined. Um, uh, there there was only one little hiccup that we ran into, and we had an opportunity to get on Inside Edition back in 2008, 2009, and that didn't happen. So that was about the only thing that didn't happen. But um, when, when I reached out to Denny and, and, and Frank and another gentleman named Dennis Arnoldy, uh, uh, former FBI guy who was like Frank's debriefer when he turned government witness. Um, when I reached out to those guys, you know, I let them know that, hey, you know, McKinney County, whatever it is, it's probably not much better than what it was back in the 80s and stuff. And those guys understood, you know, but at the same time, I also had to put on this other side, this public side that said, yeah, you know, yeah, the sheriff's office is looking into it, uh, you know, I'm, I, I believe that they're really working on it. And e- even knowing mm-hmm. that that's not exactly what I was feeling inside, because I, I, I couldn't lose the people's support, right? So if I came in there bashing the McHenry County Sheriff's Office right from the get-go, it doesn't look right, you know, because I shouldn't have any animosity towards this administration and blame them for the administration of 30 years earlier. Uh, but I knew the mm-hmm. truth better than the public, and and these were just the same guys, just a generation down. And um, so I, I knew that we had to create a constant awareness uh, to tell my father's story, and that's what we did. And when I say we, I'm, I'm speaking mainly of me and, and Dennis Griffin. Um, we would go ahead and do radio right. shows. I'd be on his radio show. Uh, we would write articles. Uh, we would do anything and everything uh, to create awareness and keep things going. Uh, started the website, started the Facebook group, and, um, right, and there was a time. And, and there was a time where uh, I'm like, "Hey, they're letting this thing die out. They're not doing anything about it." And, um, and right. they were going to let it go that way. And I knew it. And I, and I talked to Denny because Denny was was like my my litmus test is of you know am I crazy? You know I'm like Denny, this is how I'm thinking right now. I, I'm, I'm thinking we're in a bad spot. And Denny, being a former cop and everything, I knew that he could pull all, you know his vested interests or his emotions out of this, and then have a little more clarity that maybe I would. And um, and he'd be like, you're you're right on the money, Paul. I'm not getting a good feeling about this either. And so we reinvigorated that campaign, reached out to the media, the people that we've talked to and stuff like that, and they full whole, full-heartedly started calling the sheriff's office. Hey, what's going on with this? Um, is this case dying down? Have you come to any conclusions? And they just wrote them. And they never let them out of the radar, and neither did I either. 
Um, so I started calling the uh, the sheriff's office because originally I had no desire to talk to those guys. I knew what they were all about. Oh, you sure. Know? And it, I didn't, I, you know, I had to kind of live a little bit of a sham publicly, but I didn't have to have that personally, I didn't think. But at this point, I was like, no, forget these guys. I'm going to let them know I'm around, and I'm going to let them know that I'm going to call on these days every day until we get this thing figured out. And that's what I did. Sure. And, uh, and, and in uh, July of 2009, we uh, got Larry Newman named as a killer of my father and Patricia Freeman under noteworthy um, status uh, or exceptional status. Um, exceptional status is uh, referenced in times where uh, the person who is dead, like in our case with Larry Newman, or the person has been charged with so many things that they're not going anywhere anyway. So we're just going to go and kind of honorary post that he did this crime too. Um, and then there's a third reason. I don't recall what that was, but something similar to that. So right. we, we got right. mission one taken care of. But I knew mission two wasn't going to come as easy. And mission two was right. what happened when Frank Collada turned back in 1982 and told you Larry Newman, this already convicted triple murderer, killed my father. Um, what did you do with that information? Why didn't you believe him? And, of course, there's a story to that, and that's, and that's what I'm currently working on. Okay. Question for you, and I know this might sound not ignorant, but, I mean, it stands to reason that I have to throw it out there. All of us that are kind of standing in the sidelines and saying, listening to the story and hearing all the details and the backstory that goes with this, is there anything that we can do to assist you in your journey um, well, you know what? I, I, I think my book is about that. It is about um, this tragedy, but it's also about community. And my community stood up, man. Right. My community stood side by side with me, that they would, you know, uh, mm-hmm. repost some of the things that I were doing. Um, they they wrote emails and letters. Um, they they stayed interested, you know, and um, and they were always kind. Uh, so I, I love my community, and um, and I I, I think um, I think everybody's done what they could for me. I think now it's up to me just to kind of wrap a couple things up and seeing if there's any any stone that hasn't been turned over yet, and that's that's what I'm working on right now. Just keep listening, and then of course obviously I was just gonna say. Um, your dear friend, Holly, of course. Holly Hager was the individual who yeah. alerted you to the fact that uh, there was this I book out her there. So talk to us. Uh, I was just going to say that was the other thing I wanted to touch base on was, of course, to those that don't know, Holly was the individual who alerted you to the fact that Frank's book was out there, et cetera, which kind of tipped you off in terms and, in essence, got you to in some part where you are. Um so Holly, Holly must have some sense and satisfaction, at least in in partaking in in helping you to get a load off your shoulders to some extent. Do you know what I mean? Wow. Well, you gotta kind of ask Holly that, because I'll, I'll tell you, Holly uh, is one of the most humble people that I know. Uh, I, I, if I try to put her on a pedestal that she so deserves to be on, she'll she'll jab me in my chest. Um, she she she's not like that. She's a very unselfish person, and um, I would say she's a, a, at least like myself. And saying, you know, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. You know, it has nothing to do with right. you, but the right thing to do. And I and I and I think right. you know I don't want to speak for Holly, but that's where I think that she comes sure. from. So, you know, she she was embarrassed that I have her on the cover of my book, you know. And she gets embarrassed when um, I bring up praise for her. Uh, she, that's, that's just right. Holly. I wouldn't mess with her, yep. though. I'm looking at it. I was just going to say, I'm with, looking at the cover of your book right now, and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm she's, looking she's at her a and sweet, I'm thinking, beautiful girl. I don't want to do that. Yeah, she's a sweet, beautiful girl, but don't really? let that fool you. She knows how to take care of herself. 
Isn't it ironic how some of the people we know look like the nicest people in the world, but it's like, oh, my God, if you messed with them, you'd be in serious trouble in, like, 2.5 seconds. I know exactly what you're yeah. talking about, actually. I do. Right, right. I do. Well, I mean, I know there's even that side of me that that's like that. Um, you know, we were talking about, really? you know, they would, would so have to be growing up this way, and then there was Paul. Well, yeah, you know, you, you have to think that to take on the mission that I have, I have to have some teeth. Not not that I bear them or, you know, or anything like that, but I, I, I've got a target on you, you know, and I'm, I'm closing in, and I'm going to keep coming and coming and coming. And um, and I, right. I think uh, for Andrew Zanke, I don't think he would have anything nice to say about me. Um, and, and 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 that's because you know, I I didn't have anything nice to say about him, and I was willing to share it with the right. world. So yeah, I would say that that's true about me too. Um, I don't get set off easy, um, but once I'm set into motion, where we're going to see it to fruition. Sure. Exactly. No, I know exactly what you're talking about, but no, I, I just, and thank you so much, by the way, because I love the inscription that you put on the inside of my book, and thank you so much for the copy that you sent to me. Um, you bet. Susan sent me a copy. It's one of the best things that I get to do for a living is I not only get to interview people, but I get to read their works. I get to get into their head. I get to get into their hearts sometimes right. a little bit. Um and, and all that good stuff, so I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that because you're sharing a part of yourself with me, and I appreciate that. Now, I don't want to forget to do a couple business things here. Um, I'm going to read through this and just remind me if I've forgotten anything. Um, just so you all know, Paul's work, uh, actually his book, Murder and McHenry, a couple different places to find it, Amazon.com, um, HoudiniPublishing.com. He's on Goodreads, also the website, McHenry county 1981.com and then in terms of paul himself just so that you all know he has two different pages that are on facebook obviously of course his personal page and that's paul sharf which is f-c-h-a-r-f-f that's his personal page and then he has a group page by the name of murder and McHenry, which of course if you request you can go ahead and join that group so you can stay in touch with him as far as that goes um did i miss any place that you were at in social media Oh uh, no, no! I, basically, my uh, Facebook and my website; uh, those are the two places okay. uh, that I that I keep myself. Okay, I wanted to make sure that I was not not missing anything in terms of that. Oh, no. Now the last thing, because you've never met. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, no, I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure, actually. Okay, so. I have two things I want to tell you um, before I get to the very last part of my show. You've never been on my show before, so what you may not realize is the very last thing that I do when people come on my radio show is to tell them what I think of them. So that's going to be the very last thing is I get to tell you what I think of you, only because of the fact that these are reflections that I get on the basis of having researched you, having talked to you, having talked to people that know you, and then the people that listen to this show may not necessarily know about you, so I'm just going to encompass everything as far as that goes. But before I do that, I have one last question for you. And I just came up with this as I was sitting here, so forgive me. Um, So here's the question. Obviously, like I mentioned, you and I both know some of the same people. Obviously, Susan, and then there's Frank, and there's a whole list of like 16 other people that we know. Let's say, for instance, I threw this idea out to you and I said, say, Paul, I have an idea. I have an idea where I could take you and I and Susan and Frank and maybe one or two other people, and let's say that I found a venue in Vegas, for instance, and let's say that I wanted to live interview all of you and put you all in a room together and do sort of a, a mini event. Would you be interested in that? Oh, I, I, I definitely would be in. He said yes, yes, because I said to Susan, I'm like, he's never going to go for this. <laughs> I'm like, he's never no, going to go no, for I, it. But here you are saying well, yes. think that? Why would you well, think that? Because I just did. Because you're very serious, Paul. Because <laughs> the guy I'm talking to on my radio show, I'm like, oh, my God, you're very serious. And I know this is a very serious subject. And I'm a very, I'm a hippie artist type girl. So I'm very off. Well, I'm actually kind of a funny guy. Very silly. <laughs> well, I don't yeah, know. I've been I, I the guy. Yet, I'm actually kind insane. of a funny guy. <laughs> but, you know, business okay. is business. Well, I wanted you know, to throw that out there. Right, 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 exactly. But 
on my show, uh, as you can tell, because you've been on my radio show for an hour and a half now, and I would hope that oh. you see now that I'm a highly prof- – it's been an hour and a half, honey, 7.05. Wow. Time All flies. right, is that a bad thing? I've kept your no, attention, I hope. Oh, not that's good. At they all. See, a I lot of people come on my I show and they say know. that. That yes, yes. Um, so I hope that I've proven my worth. I hope that I've shown that I've done an original, out of the ordinary, out of the box sort of interview. Because um, it's been very professional. I, I hope, and I hope that I surprised you, and I and I made it different than all these other interviews. Because Paul made a point to say to me, he's done all these interviews and all this good stuff. So I was hoping that I was going to be able to surprise him um, and, and make things different. So I hope that I have. Yes. And we've been very professional. So the last thing that I want to say, and then I'm going to do this whole little rundown of, of what I think of Paul um, so that all of you know this. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm planning this event, uh, but what you don't know is that I'm coming to your neck of the woods very soon. And so um, I'm anticipating, with any luck at all, um, that I'll send you these dates and information, and then I'll say yes, because I've been wanting to go out to dinner with you for probably two months now, and I don't want to wait anymore. So I'm coming there just so I can have dinner with you. In in Texas or back in the country? Yes, in Texas. Oh, okay, okay. All right, go on. Well, I was pushed to do that. I was. I was pushed to do that. I'm like, okay, well, I can wait. And then someone said to me, no, 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 you should go and you should meet him. So I'm I'm pushing up my plans to, to come and have dinner with you because I think it's important and because my heart tells oh, me. Oh, very so cool. Like, okay, I should let him know that. Well, yeah, so I thought you'd like that. So the last thing that I want to do is to tell you and everybody else that's listening what I think of Paul. Um. So here it goes. It's just a two-minute rendition. Um, One of the first things that I learned about Paul prior to even thinking about putting him on my radio show is all of the high accolades and all of the high praise that was given to me well before I even met him, meaning on Facebook, social media, or otherwise, or had heard about his book or his life story. So many people had come and had said so many nice things about you in terms of who you were as a person, what you were accomplishing in terms of your mission, and what your bam- your family's backstory was. So I was immediately impressed by the, the opportunity that I would have to showcase someone's family history in a positive light. When I first talked to you and then starting to learn more things about you, what I found out was is this is a very grounded man who has had some bad experiences in his life. He's lost someone that was very close to him that he loved a great deal, and he maintained and carried on with some sense of composure and compassion. He's grounded. He's professional. He is a wonderful man with wonderful character and demeanor. The times that I've spent talking to him, he has a great sense of humor. He's very lighthearted. He is extremely professional, as you can see by the basis of this interview, and how he talks and how he carries himself. He continues to carry on the memory of his father, as well as continues to talk about maintaining and preserving the ideals of justice. And, and nowadays, in this day and age, there's very, very little of that going on. There are, there are many people that talk about doing the right thing, but you're one of the people that actually steps forth and does it. And he does it with such great style and great character. You're a man who should be respected not only for your family history, but because of the fact that you've become an individual that people revere, an individual that people want to meet, somebody that people want to spend time with. I'm the first one who would stand here and say that I'm your cheerleader. Why? Not because of the fact that you have this tragic life story, but because of what you've become despite the fact that you lived through tragedy, despite the fact that you have associated with people that may not necessarily like you or love you. You stood and rose above all of this controversy, and you've come on the other side and become this absolutely adorable, wonderful man that I so look forward to meeting and getting to know because I, I just, I'm very enamored with you. You as a person, you and your story, you and the person you're going to become. Um, I can't wait to hear you play guitar, and hopefully with any luck at all, at some point in time, you'll come back to me again a year from now or whenever and say, I want to come back on your show and I want to talk to you and I want to share about all the great things that are going on and not just talk about the loss and, and, and the book, but you want to talk about you. So that's what I think of you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm so flattered. I, I really don't even know what to say to that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> that I'm happens afraid. a lot. <laughs> but that's a lot of truth. And, and if you know me, you would know that it's, I'm all about keeping it real. Yeah, right, right. I, I, I know yeah. that about you. And that's <laughs> why I'm so okay. flattered by this. So thank you for that. That's, it's true. I, 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 don't, I don't even know how to respond. 
Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I just um, I wanted you to know from me to you, and this is the only platform where I can actually make you listen to me because it's my radio show. So now <laughs> you've heard everything that I have to say. Um, I was going to go for the whole embarrassing moment because Susan said to me, you know what, while you're on the air, you should actually tell them what you think of them. And I'm like, no, you know, I couldn't do the whole, you know, I could do things, but I'm not going to. Because usually I will embarrass a guest at least one point in time just to get them to smile or have a great time. But I, I think, honestly, sure. if we've gone on for this long, you know, almost two hours, I think that says something right there. So all I can say is, like I said, everything I just said, um, just to let you know and to let fans know, of course, you know how the drill works. Within about an hour, hour and a half, this will be an archived episode that you can re, you know, post up on your page and, and the group page, et cetera. And then, like I said, when we get off of here, we should probably chit-chat about orchestrating an event. And moreover, I'm talking about me being in Texas. <laughs> I would love that. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm in. Well, you're all set. You're all off the hook now. You can get off of my show, and I'll finish talking to everybody and let them know about the shows next week. And then um, – Bug me, and then we'll talk about what's going on. Well, that sounds good. I want to thank everybody for listening, and, of course, thank you, Cindy, for having me on. Of course, Paul. I'll be talking to you soon. All right. You take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, dear. Bye-bye. Wasn't that just amazing? Paul Scharf. Um, again, want to go through the ways in which you can go ahead and get a copy of his book, which is, of course, Murder and McHenry. And I don't want to forget to mention some of the other individuals that we talked about tonight. Um, he has co-authored this memoir with Keith Bettinger. He can be found on Facebook as well, and you can find some information about some of the books that he's done. You can get a copy of the book through Goodreads, Amazon.com, HoudiniPublishing.com. Uh, website, of course, for Paul is McHenry county 1981.com and then the two ways to find him on facebook are paul sharf and that's a personal page and then of course the group page being murder and kenry i want to first and foremost say thank you so much once again to paul for taking the time and the trouble and approaching me and getting in contact with me and allowing me to spend this amount of time with him um, to talk about himself to talk about his life story to talk about the memory of his father i'm just so touched more than i can tell you as far as that goes I'm strongly looking forward to a chance where we can both get in the same room together and just talk on a social basis. Don't want to forget to mention, of course, just what we had talked about, um, and of course Paul had mentioned it earlier um, in the interview, we want to throw a shout-out to um, Gangland Wire, which is, of course, produced by Gary Jenkins. He's going to be a future guest on my show, and I'll post information up about how to find Gangland Wire as far as that goes. And, of course, the infamous Frank Julio. I will go ahead and put up information in reference to his book and where you'll be able to find him. And the spelling and his last name, that's Frank, and it's Culotto, actually. It's C-U-L-L-O-T-T-A, authored the book called Culotto, The Life of a Chicago Criminal, and I'll post that information up as well. And with that note, uh, that leaves me off the radio for this week. I'm going to be at the Boyd Film Festival tomorrow um, afternoon and evening representing the film called I Don't Know. Big thanks to Colin Gerard in terms of letting me go ahead and represent his film tomorrow evening. I want to say a big, huge thanks to Susan Ferrito, to anybody that follows me on Facebook. You already know that to me... She is probably the, the biggest equivalent to a real mom that I could find. Um, thank you for your contribution to today's interview. Uh, thank you for your presence in my life. Thank you for your guidance, for your inspiration, for your motivation, and thanks most of all for recognizing me, um, for being me. That's all I can say, and I love you. Um, and next week we will be back on on Tuesday. So watch the wall or watch the show pages for information in reference to my upcoming shows. Thank you. What you doing? Ran out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. Bye, singing dog. Bye, goal. I pronounce you. Bye, wedding ceremony. Stop! At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS, wireless, figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T-Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions. What you doing? Ran out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. Bye, singing dog. Bye, goal. I pronounce you. Bye, wedding ceremony. Stop! At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS, wireless, figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T-Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions.